Yeah. Did you see Ralph's kick off? No. There's no. always a self of the foot every single <laughs> summer that he obliges everyone to, to join us. Yeah, on. I will tweet it later. We love our graphics, so uh, hopefully this will be great. Uh, so this is me, and um, I actually, I've been at NVIDIA for about three years. I um, have many, many roles and, and wear different hats at NVIDIA, um, and this is um, one that pretty much brings together everything that I do. Um, it's actually a research accelerator. So for eight weeks, um, we bring together AI scientists or computer scientists with, in this case, planetary scientists, and that could be um, solar plasma um, physicists, it could be heliophysicists, um, anything to do with protecting the planet. Um, essentially, it started with NASA asking the question, how do we harness AI? But what we managed to do was put both sides of the equation into the same room, give them um, a few weeks, and at the end of which, they literally have a TRL prototype, so that's tech-ready level prototype. So it, we, we like to accelerate everything at NVIDIA, essentially. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, is the, the hardware side, the evolution side, but also the, the, the personal side of, of AI. And I've got a lot to get through, so I will uh, keep on moving through. Um, I love this slide, simply. Um, so this, this comes from Ray Kurzweil's Singularity, um, the, the book. And it's um, essentially an indication of, of where we are. So at the moment, um, the world's affordable um, computers, we believe by 2025, will mimic the brain power of ourselves, uh, the human brain. Um, but this is basically because of the way things have been progressing um, since back in 85, when we we're essentially at a billionth of the capability of ourselves in computer-wise. Um, and then move to a millionth, um, and then a thousandth in, in 2015. So we, we're on track by 2025. Um, and it's, um, it's probably the, the other side that we have to think about. This is a great image from um, Tim, Ur Tim Urban's Wait But Why, um, probably one of the best AI articles that I've ever read. It's a bit of an epic. Um, it's in two parts, but essentially it talks about the fact that um, we have a lot of biases, um, and the biggest one probably is, is what we actually think about AI, and the fact of how fast things are actually progressing, not just on the compute side, but also on the, on the AI side. This is the actual reality, um, and um, Tim, Tim goes on to describe this in a lot more detail than I actually have, but the simple fact is that we really are in um, this 
this world, this, this era of AI. Um, and it's, it is most definitely defining us. Um, unsupervised um, techniques, things like autoencoders and GANs, generative adversarial networks, um, are being used, but certainly not as much as, and as significantly as much as um, supervised learning applications, which is why people are always talking about data. Data is essentially like experience. You know, it takes us 25 years to, be, to get to PhD level. The more data that you throw at an AI system, um, the, the, the more profound it is, and the more applicable, of course, um, to each of the, of the problems that, that, that we have. But don't make the mistake that deep learning is everything. Please don't fall into the hype that you actually see. This is a slide from, um, from Yang King Jia. He's um, ex-Berkeley, um, now Facebook. Um, this is one of his slides from the Scaled ML conference back in March. Infra AI is Facebook's internal infrastructure for AI. And the reason I'm showing you this is to just um, show even at Facebook at that kind of level, you know, billion scale um, AI, they are still using support vector machines. They are still using classical machine learning as well as convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. So um, don't think that deep learning is, is everything. In fact, this is actually work um, on electrophysiology at ETH Zurich. Um, they're basically studying the currents that flow through, through our brain. Um, Fraunhofer's Christoph von der Malsberg has completely um, just eliminated deep learning. He doesn't believe in it whatsoever. He's jumped ahead already, and he's looking at things called net fragments um, that it, it essentially they, they act as, as puzzles. So deep learning is one step on this road, on this evolution that we're, that we're witnessing, just very, very accelerated right now. Um, so don't believe the, the hype, believe in the research and um, study on, from the research. There are upwards of 80 papers a day being published now um, on archive. Um, and the power um, of, of AI, I think, is because we share this knowledge now. Um, it, not only can you publish overnight, you know, in a, in a matter of an hour, once you've actually written the paper, but we can share it amongst ourselves, and that really counts. We spend a significant amount of time on human intelligence at NVIDIA. We have a large research arm, both in Santa Clara, California, where HQ is, but also in Helsinki. Um, and and we, we need to do this because we need to provide proof of concepts to all of the customers that we actually work with. Um, it's things like Cutlass, um, and again, you can just go to the GitHub site and actually download this. All of our software is free. Cutlass enables um, you to uh, to essentially, again, it's just fast linear algebra, algebra but it's, it's putting the power of our latest card, our latest hardware, and the instruction set that we wrote for that, which is something called TensorCores, where we are taking the brunt of the matrix multiplication and accumulate operations and making it even easier. So we kind of optimize as much as we can and then just push out there. Um, so getting down to the actual applications, this is what time series data used to look like. Very, very laborious, very boring, um, and, and not that easy to comprehend. You know, I just had a conversation before. We are not geared to be able to um, understand the entire human genome, for example. This is how time series data um, should actually look like. What you're looking at is a 1.1 terabyte um, data set. Hopefully you can see that. It's still a little bit bright here. It's a 1.1 terabyte data set of a supernova. Um, the full simulation essentially is over 1,077 time steps. With GPUs, we could basically produce the compute and the rendering within 10 minutes of this entire incredible, I mean, a, a supernova can literally be over in seconds. Um, but the compute on CPU, the original computation was on the Blue Water CPU only. Um, but this is the generation of the data and the simulation is really, really important to us. Um, what you have to do as well is just remember why we're all here, why people study AI, why we, um, why we invented AI. Um, and it's essentially to, to augment ourselves, to make life easier for ourselves 
don't fall into the trap that it's all about people losing jobs. It's probably just going to um, move a few people into jobs that they'll have a much better life doing. Um, but it will also help people in the jobs that they already know. It's really important when you deploy AI to just augment existing skill sets and to try not to disrupt too much. Um, and a lot of people are, are really aware of that. There are things happening today that maybe you don't actually know about that you thought were science fiction. Colonel Brian Johnson has actually um, been working on, on his company, Colonel, and brain-computer interfaces for over a decade now. It was only this logo in the, in the bottom left here is actually Neuralink, which is Elon Musk. As soon as Elon Musk jumped on this, then obviously everything got um, a little bit bigger on the, on the PR scale, on the marketing scale. What they're doing is they're literally um, working with organic silicon and they're, fine, they're trying to bring down the, um, the, the bandwidth, the, the latency um, between us and, you know, if you think about how long it takes you to write a text message or, you know, even just um, have a conversation. These things are happening right now and it's very, very profound. Um, a lot of what um, is almost done, in a sense, now, is the training side of supervised learning applications. Inference, so, so inference making the prediction based on new data, is the next big challenge. And this is because we're coming down to low power, low swap, size, weight, and power budgets. Um, and, you know, it's not just mobile phones anymore, it's tiny sensors that are all over the place. Um, this is um, just, you probably won't be able to read it too, too easily, but this is uh, the latest McKinsey um, study on, on AI. Travel, so transportation, self-driving cars, trucks, trains, autonomy in vehicles is, you know, over, is, is it double the, the average um, throughout the entire sector. Um, so basically, it, it's no surprise that we're certainly all in on self-driving cars, because if you nail the self-driving car application, that includes every single other application that you could think of. Um, it's not, it's, it is mainly convolutional neural networks, simply because they work in the, in the, in the static world. This is about pattern, pattern recognition for the static world. Um, but then we keep coming up with really cool tricks. So capsules or capnets um, was the latest paper from Hinton's lab. Um, this essentially allows you to put nested layers within each layer of the convolutional neural network, but it also allows something called dynamic routing, where the system itself can basically determine whether or not to use certain amounts of information. It's almost a sense of, a sense of reasoning. Um, but it's a very powerful self-learning technique. Um, RNNs, or rather the, the implementation um, that, that works of LSTM, has been around for over 25 years. Now, this still dominates the, um, the dynamic world, where it's time series or sequential data. Um, the actual space that we're looking at is, is phenomenally um, complex. So the mathematics, and uh, it really does come down to matrix multiplication and accumulate, the mathematics needs GPUs um, in its parallel processing capability. Volta, for example, has 5,120 separate cores. That's 5,120 separate um, operations that it can cope with, even before you start getting into hyperthreading. Um, there's lots of other techniques that are, that are being um, brought up day in, day out, actually. Pruning is a good one because it brings down not only the floating point operations, but obviously the compute time, time to insight um, expense. Um, and it actually shows that certain connections are irrelevant or, you know, at least redundant to, um, to the applications at hand. Um, this is a very active area of research. Uh, things like differentiable programming. Um, this is the GOMBOK, and uh, basically um, folks believe that dynamic programming will allow us to do much more exquisite optimization. It's a, it's, it is really all about optimization. Feature engineering can be done purely by, by um, optimization. And this is a sense of um, things like meta-learning, where we're using the neural network to literally optimize itself um, to, to design better neural networks. And it kind of goes on and on into the inception, like the movie, essentially. Um, so this is sort of um, deep dive into, into the Volta streaming multiprocessor um, multi architecture. Um, the reason I'm showing this is, is, is literally just to highlight 
that we are developing so fast, um, and this is simply because of the demands of the AI research community, we're developing so fast that it's actually getting quite hard for people to keep up, and that includes the mass, the long tail of researchers. There are a core set of researchers that know how to use tensor cores, four by four by four matrix arrays, um, which speeds up this, this matrix multiplication, dramatically speeds up. Um, but it's really difficult to, you know, essentially educate everybody. The same with things like parallelization. So deep learning training, the whole point of using GPU is, is for all of the processing cores. And most people still haven't moved onto multi-GPU. When you actually look with a single GPU, clearly you load, the, you load the data and you're just doing weight updates that are local. When you start bringing in multiple GPUs, um, you have to start splitting between them. So first of all, you would load the training data and then you have to synchronize the weights um, between it. So essentially you're, you're coding differently. It's parallel programming. There are lots and lots of um, tricks again. So Uber came up with um, Horovod and we were working directly with them. And, and we've, we've done integrated software, um, which helps on that. But when you start getting into the multi-GPU territory, you also have to then take into account this massive amount of data transfer that's going on in between the GPUs and GPU to CPU. Don't forget the GPU is a coprocessor. You still need the CPU. So this is essentially us optimizing um, PCIe. This is us optimizing to five times the speed of PCIe Gen 4. Now, um, every switch, and we essentially had to do that, and I'll show you why in just a few more slides. But this is the really profound stuff that's going on now. Um, and it's, it's the way that we learn as well, learning by mistakes, learning by extreme trial and error, essentially. But it, it, it basically aligns perfectly with robotics. So the reinforcement learning and the robotics side, and remember that the, that the, the best example of a robot is the self-driving car itself. In fact, it's actually an easier version because you deliberately don't want to, you know, bump into things. Um, this maps perfectly with, um, with reinforcement learning. You essentially, you, you're given an environment, so an agent then basically um, is in a state, it has to make an action, and the consequences of that action um, affect the environment, and you're bringing in reasoning all about it, and this just goes on and on, and this is how we live our lives, essentially. So we're getting very, very close to the neuroscience side. Um, now, robotics um, on, the, um, on the physical side, so this is the Atlas um, robot from uh, Boston Dynamics. Um, the Spot Mini that they used to have, Spot Mini actually came to, to the number one AI conference in um, 2016. It didn't have any kind of AI, it was just very, very cool. You know, this thing walked around the stage and everybody was on the chairs, you know, taking selfies and, and all sorts of things. But there was no AI. Literally now, Spot Mini has um, autonomous navigation. Um, I remember having this conversation with, with the CEO that, you know, you really have to get some AI in that. It would be very cool. But on the, on the virtual side, it's very, very powerful because you have infinite resources. It doesn't matter if this $1 million uh, robot falls over and gets broken because it doesn't get broken. It's in a virtual environment. But you can also um, harness the capability of parallelization, having thousands and thousands of virtual agents all playing against themselves. Here, they're essentially trying to learn good behavior, not knocking into one another, et cetera. And we've actually been playing in this space um, for, for quite a while now. Well, this, this tends to just go on and on and on. But um, we've been playing in this, in this space, in this virtual environment space for a long time. We call it immersive AI. And we actually produce something called Project Holodeck, which is essentially just a virtual world. Um, and you can bring in any kind of CAD model. Here, we brought in a CAD model of a, of a race car. You put on a VR headset, you all, get, you all join each other in the virtual environment, and you can work on it. And you have full manipulation, full haptics. It's also photorealistic. Um, you know, we're not going to, we're, we're a graphics company, essentially. We're not going to uh, mess up on the actual graphics. But what you can also do, which is even cooler, is you can put deep learning into the virtual environment. What you're looking at is um, my colleague Hamad's, um, it's the screenshot or the view from his VR headset. 
He's in the virtual environment. We've created this really cute nursery look. Um, and he's teaching the robot with reinforcement learning um, and um, value and policy networks, actually, um, how to play dominoes. Once that robot's learnt how to significantly beat, um, you know, you in at dominoes, that's literally just you, you end up with a trained set of weights, and then you can just deploy that into a real robot. Um, and this, um, obviously, this is just a, a trivial example. Um, it's got a really hilarious audio, but... Um, what you do is you do your training in simulation. This is just one. Obviously, you could have thousands of these robots, these virtual PR2s, um, doing the training, and then you actually just deploy. Um, and like I said, you're literally just deploying a set of weights um, into a real robot, and it learns by reinforcement learning. Um, I don't have time for this to sort of play out in full, but... Um, it's, it's really that simple. And then, obviously, playing hockey, putting a hockey puck into a net isn't that productive, clearly. So you need to be doing something um, applicable. And, and this is what the self-driving car is. And, and people are starting to use reinforcement learning, but actually um, supervised learning aspects have, have really picked up on pretty much every single aspect. Um, and, and it's multiple networks that are being used um, to actually produce results that are adequate and, and safe. Um, this is a, a huge endeavor. Um, we've actually been doing this for quite a few years now. We have a small fleet of cars. Um, and those who are struggling with the data, this is another reason why we're doing so well in AI. And I mean, by we, I mean society, um, because we share data. This is the latest from, from Berkeley um, Deep Drive. They've just released another 100,000 videos that are um, bound in boxes, et cetera, that, that you can use to get started on. Um, this is Waymo's car craft. Waymo uses this because their virtual cars can literally drive billions of miles a day. Um, you, can, you can bring up any kind of corner case that you can think of, and it's really essential. This is work, um, a research paper that we've just put out um, from NVIDIA Research, which actually describes um, the difference between using simulated data and using um, real data. In, you know, and deploying that in the real world and what difference it would actually make. And it turns out that it actually improves the system by using simulated data as well as real world. But the biggest problem is the staggering amount of compute that you actually need. And this is why we are literally re-engineering constantly. Um, things like 100 DGX. Each one of these nodes is what we call DGX, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, you need about 100 of them per car to compute um, the actual data that, that is being brought in. So what we did was we literally redesigned and, and, and built a chip specifically for self-driving cars. Now, it's an ASIC, an application-specific integrated circuit, but that application is AI, is deep learning, is the matrix um, um, multiply and, and accumulate operations. Um, there are so many different factors on board. It's six separate processes, and one of them is, is, is what we call DLA. It's the Deep Learning Accelerator. Um, and we actually open sourced it. So you can actually go to this website, get all of the tech specs, build it yourself, um, and deploy it. Because what we're trying to do, essentially, is turn that, which is the boot of, uh, of today's self-driving cars, into this. But the really phenomenal thing, um, and of course, this is AI and the demand from researchers that's driving this. We, we basically do what the researchers need. We've already surpassed Xavier. We've put two of them together to make Pegasus, which is capable of 320 trillion operations per second. We're down at int eight now, so we're not dealing with floating point. Um, and then we've done it again because we've, we've essentially, in, in just a few months, put two Pegasus together, um, and we now have Orin, which is the next generation. There's also a version um, called we, we have embedded GPUs, which are about the size of a credit card, and there's now a Xavier version of Jetson. Um, if you're already developing on the Jetson platform, you can apply for early access, which will be in August, um, and it's, it's pretty phenomenal um, what it's capable of doing. There's a, also a really cool demo. We just did a, a live webinar yesterday, um, and this relates to, you can go to the GitHub um, to figure out exactly how you use Jetson um, to, to do live, real, um, you know, very profound work, um, especially in, in robotics. Um, this just goes to show the difference in the performance and the jumps that we've actually made um, across um, CUDA on its own, 
um, versus CPU. Um, codec, so this is video, encode, decode, that is just another part of it. Um, and this is all because we recently um, partnered with ARM, um, and this is all about enabling AI um, the, and, and IoT. This is a very busy, complicated slide, and it's intentional, because you can't do anything at scale until you address this entire scene, what we call orchestration, and it is very, very complex. Um, to be able to put all of the hardware together um, to, to do at scale, um, you know, if you think about Facebook and data centers, that kind of thing. But basically, we work with everyone involved, even down to the storage now, which is getting prepared for AI. It's AI-ready storage. Um, and that's because we've actually been working in the HPC space for, for over a decade now. We know what it takes to actually build a supercomputer. Um, the summit um, supercomputer came online just a few days ago in the US um, that's using all our, all our Volta GPUs. It's capable of 3.3 exa operations per second. That's um, a billion billion. Um, it's really staggering, but it's all about bringing faster insight to the massive, you know, think of that supernova, being able to, to get insight in, in 10 minutes um, for something as massive as a, as a supernova. And, and this is why we're essentially building this entire platform, which I'll just whip through these now. All the software is free. Just sign up to developer.nvidia.com and you just get the, get the software. We've done a lot of the hard work for you. Tensor RT4 is specifically, it's almost, it's a compiler essentially to optimize inference because you cannot have, um, for example, a self-driving car taking just a couple of seconds, for example, to make a decision. It has to be nanoseconds or, you know, at most seven milliseconds is the target. So we have to make this as absolutely fast as possible. And that's using any of the major frameworks. It basically pipelines through TensorRT and then deploys anywhere, whether it's a car embedded or in a data center, for example. Um, it's actually, we've done all the development with Onyx. I don't know if anybody's actually heard of this, but this is about standardizing the fact that there are 60 plus different deep learning frameworks out there. Um, and it, it's also supported for Xavier. And we have to do that because this is the latest thing that we've actually done, which is we now don't have DGX, which is those nodes I showed you in the supercomputer. That's eight um, GPUs. We now have 16 GPUs in two different layers. And that's the reason that we had to re-engineer MV switch, which is this fabric interconnect. Um, we literally have to, have to design it all. Um, because this is what people are um, craving now, um, industry as well. This is essentially like having a data center of your own. It's, it's capable of two petaflops. Um, and it is literally the size, it's like the coolest mini bar you've ever seen, because that's the size of it. Um, but it's a data center. But again, as with all of the DGX systems, we've made things as, as simple as humanly possible. And all of the software is within that appliance. So you can have it as a self-contained unit. If, if for example, you're, you're in a very sensitive, you know, perhaps government facility and you can't just link to the internet, it's, it's actually all self-contained. Um, and the container registry is all about literally keeping the software up to date because the iterations on the software is um, unprecedented. Ever since I joined NVIDIA, I think we were at um, QDNN, so that's CUDA for Deep Neural Networks, we were at version one, we're now at version seven. Um, CUDA itself is in version nine. It's constant, but with the containerized system, you literally just, just pull down the latest update. And so it makes everything really simple. And that includes visualization and simulation software that's really important. So that was a ton of info. Um, don't think that you have to remember everything. We also put a stack of training online. There's some free classes, um, but there are over um, 200 different classes bespoke to whatever application um, concerns you. Just go to nvidia.com or .co.uk slash DLI. DLI means Deep Learning Institute. And it's a very cool way of learning in a um, Jupyter IPython notebook environment where you can literally run code because we're bursting into um, Amazon Web Services. All of the major cloud providers have our GPUs on board, but it's a very simple way of learning more um, because if you are a beginner, jump on this really fast train, but really if you are a beginner, you won't get it 
until you've played with some code, even if you've never coded before. So this makes it very simple to, to literally jump on board. If you have any really cool ideas as well and you, you're trying to set up a startup, we have a full program where we provide support. Um, and this includes you know, anything from cash prizes to discounts on, on hardware. It's really about the fact that we've built this ecosystem to, to help people move forward and, and progress with AI. Um, we have lots and lots of conferences. The next one is um, in October in Munich. So come along if you want to, to learn even more. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, so there's two sides to it. One, obviously, it's great. Um, it took us by surprise. But because it took us by surprise, it therefore affected demand everywhere. And um, even two years ago, we had to do the two per customer. Um, um, you know, we, we introduced um, the Volta version of, of Titan. It's really difficult to... We, we literally can't produce enough. Um, and, and this is... You know, this is silicon we're talking about. You know, we kind of know how to make a lot of it. Um, but we can't. We can't produce a lot. Um, China did this big ban, though, and that has sort of affected things. Um, so, um, yeah, hopefully it'll come back down to normal. But I've had many disgruntled people saying, how, how can I get more than two GPUs? But we just, we had to do it. It's, you know, crypto's very cool. You know, I've, I've literally got colleagues. Um, I mentioned NVIDIA Research. Um, is, based, is mainly, well, about 40% of them are in Helsinki. One of, the, one of my colleagues from there literally heats his, um, his house from um, the amount of GPUs he's running for mining. It's, it's, it's just brilliant. Honestly, it's fantastic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I've enjoyed all these presentations so far. They're all amazing. I was uh, aghast listening to some of the, uh, the numbers coming out of NVIDIA there. It's pretty amazing. Uh, first, I want to apologize. Um, I have to give this talk in American English, not British English. So hopefully, you'll all be able to understand me OK. Uh, my name is Kevin Nelson. I'm uh, in developer relations at Google. Um, I focus a lot on uh, storage and then what you do with bits once they're up in the cloud that kind of flows over into big data analytics and now machine learning. Um, over the last three or four months that has been almost exclusively in the machine learning area because there's just such demand uh, for the topic. Um, I like to think of machine learning as, as really two different things. Um, you know, the old way of programming is you come up with a set of procedures, heuristics, you figure out ways you want to do something. Um, in machine learning, we're addressing problems that either can't be done at scale or can't be done at all. Uh, can't be done at scale example would be there are 70 million diabetics in India. Um, there's a disease called diabetic retinopathy that is very common among diabetics. And there literally aren't enough ophthalmologists in India to be able to look at the images and issue diagnoses. Um, and then when you look at things that may not be able to do at all, 
you look what's happened over time, over the last, just in the last decade. Um, a decade ago, it was impossible for a computer to distinguish between a cat and a dog, something any two-year-old can do with almost 100% accuracy. As you move through time, now a, a few years ago, all of a sudden, um, deep learning algorithms by Microsoft and Google and others were able to uh, outperform uh, trained radiologists in diagnosing disease in tissue images. So I'd like to give a, a couple quick examples. Um, the cat versus dog is something very, very well understood. You can understand how that could be possibly confusing. There's a lot of similarities. They have four legs, they have a nose and ears. But how about just distinguish, distinguishing between a dog and a muffin? That seems like it'd be pretty trivial. Um, obviously, you know, dogs have hair and ears and nose and eyes and legs. Muffins are round. They may be dome-shaped. They may be in a wrapper. But once you get into the edge cases, <laughs> once you get into the edge cases in looking at real-world data, you realize how messy the world actually is. And this is obviously a fun, silly example. But in any domain you want to look at, you're going to find cases like this, where no matter how smart you are, no matter how much you think you can write algorithms to distinguish between two seemingly you know, absurdly different objects, you're going to find situations like this. So obviously, machine learning, as we just you know, heard about in the last talk, is being applied in lots of different domains. Self-driving cars is a very obvious one. Uh, communication, we're now um, starting to be able to translate in real time. So the, uh, the Star Trek Universal Communicator, Universal Translator, is, uh, is coming soon. Um, and of course, uh, there have been some great headlines about playing games. Um, Google had a program a couple of years ago uh, through DeepMind called AlphaGo that beat the, uh, the top world players. And more recently, there's been a new version called AlphaGo Zero. Al the original AlphaGo was trained by feeding in lots and lots of game examples from top humans and then letting it start to work on itself. AlphaGo Zero started from base principles. The, the program was taught what the rules of the game were, and then it just played against itself. And the, once we started, once AlphaGo Zero was ready, Starting with training, in three days of training, it beat the version of AlphaGo that beat the world champion Lee Sedol. In 21 days of training, it beat the version of AlphaGo that had advanced a year and beat 60 top champions, including KG, in three straight games. After 40 days, it beat the best version of AlphaGo, what we now call AlphaGo Master, this kind of hand-coded neural network. And now it is continuing to learn from that. So these, these new systems are being able to grow exponentially now on their own. So Google has a series of pre-trained models that are accessible to anybody. Um, there are uh, you know, obviously vision, translation, uh, natural language development. I'll have links to these on my last slide, so if you want to hold off, you can, uh, you can get links to, these, links to these at the very, very end. So I want to show off one on vision as a lead into what I'm going to talk about with AutoML. So the vision API takes the pixels of an image and it can, it then gives you back information about that image. It will detect objects, it will detect, it will uh, label, it will give you the OCR, uh, the text within the image. It'll do logo detection. So if you're doing IP protection, for instance, you can find these things and then identify them around the web. It will also tell you whether, whether an image is likely to be considered adult content. So if you don't want things showing up on your website unexpectedly, you can filter this so that you're, you're keeping it safe for the family. So this is an example. Um, I was in Mexico City last week uh, giving a similar talk at an Apogee conference. And this is in a stairwell in the Mexico City office. I was curious how the Vision API would do with OCR on this image. So I took a picture, I fed it into the, into the model, which you can do. There's a, you can just drag, drag and drop a photo onto a page. I'll give you the link at the end. 
So if you notice the yellow lines around each piece of text, it identified all that text, and I was really curious how it would do on the angle text, and it did it perfectly. Um, it breaks it down into paragraphs, and which then you can then use obviously to have metadata to inform what is in the image. Uh, landmark detection, obviously a very, very well-known uh, well object. There's a simple REST API. You upload the image, you tell it what, what portions of the metadata you want back, and it will, it will reply. So in this case, it has correctly identified this object as the Eiffel Tower. That MID, I don't know if, if that text is too visible or not, but the MID is the ID into Google's knowledge graph. So any object that is identified as the Eiffel Tower will produce the same MID in this case. So you can then go explore additional information about that. It indicates the confidence. So in this case, it's 90% confident that this, is the, that this is the Eiffel Tower. It gives a bounding box for the area of the image that it used to identify this particular thing. And in this case, because it's a landmark, it also shows the, the location in latitude and longitude. Um, it can do other things that aren't quite as well known. So this is obviously a car. Um, when you run this through, it says that, oh, this is an interesting car. It happens to be in a museum. It tells you where it is. And again, uh, it shows you the, the, uh, where you can find additional information about that. It identifies this car. It's a Ford Anglia. Well, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that, but I'm glad that uh, the Vision API knew. But what's interesting about this car is that this was a car used in the Harry Potter movies. So it is able to tell you, identify that specific car, where it is in the context to give you more information about that particular object. It will also show you where you can find more information about this. So it will tell you where you can find ex identical matching images on the web or partial images so you can see who else is using this image out on the web and possibly find out additional information. Again, this is a very simple REST API. Here's a little code snippet in Node. Um, you just set up uh, which pieces of metadata you want back, you submit the image, and then you get those particular objects. So let's do a quick demo on, on that. So again, this is a, a page. It's cloud.google.com slash vision. You can go there. Anybody can try this with any image that you like. I have a couple images that I'm going to try out here. I'm just going to drag that in there. And again, it's an image of the Eiffel Tower. But interestingly, this is not the actual Eiffel Tower, but it is the Eiffel Tower at the Paris Hotel in Las Vegas. And the Vision API was able to distinguish that. So as we go through the information you can collect, you attach their labels so you can categorize the image. So in this case, it's a landmark, there's sky, it's a tower, etc. From the web, there are links to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, Las Vegas. It has certain properties of colors and shapes. And it says that this is likely not to be an unsafe image. And then the actual JSON that you can then pull into your program to then collect and store, process the information any way that you like. So let's go back here. So that's great as long as the images you're trying to recognize are similar to images that can be found on the web. Uh, it's a general purpose model that's very good at identifying general purpose types of subjects. But let's say I have some domain specific information that I'm trying to use. So let's say that I'm a, a route planner for an airline or possibly a logistics company. And I need to be able to predict the weather. And I have heard that I can do that a little bit by looking at clouds. So I want to be able to predict the weather based on images that are collected locally at any given point for the event that I'm trying to do. There are 10 plus types of clouds um, that all indicate different types of weather. So we want to know if we could use the cloud to analyze clouds. 
And first, we can try the standard vision API, and we will, it will tell us that, yes, indeed, that is a cloud. But it will not tell us anything about the type of cloud. So this is where we're able to apply AutoML. So traditionally, there have been, uh, you could use a, a pre-trained model like the Vision API, or you had to go all the way to the far end and build your own neural network, your own machine learning model to be able to work with the specific trained data that you wanted to use. AutoML puts in the middle where it's a, it's a transfer learning process. It builds on the, on the pre-trained model, but then takes your additional data, your additional tagged data, and applies that and builds a neural network that can distinguish those objects. So I'm going to jump into a demo now real quick and show you how this looks for this model we built to train clouds. And then I'm going to go further then into a little more detail on what's going on behind the scenes. So that is distinctly not readable. Is that better? Can you see that at all or more? Let's try it there so I don't end up with too little things to see. So um, currently AutoML is in early access, so there are 200 customers using this. Um, it's not generally available yet, but I, I hope we're going to hear more about additional accessibility coming up at Next in July. I don't have anything specific that I know, but um, I'm hoping we're going to hear more at Next. So in this case, this is a completely web-based protocol. You come in and you identify the images that you want to use. In our case, we, we went out and asked the people in our developer relations group to send us any images of clouds that they had. We collected about 1,500 images, and we then needed to get them tagged. You'll notice that as I, as I mouse over each of these, it tells us what type of cloud that is. It's zero, the last one here is zero stratus. Now, we needed someone skilled to be able to do this. None of us are really experts in clouds. So we started looking around how we could find maybe a meteorologist or something to help us tag these images. Well, it turns out that Google has a meteorologist on staff. And when I first heard that, I kind of did one of these you know, eye roll and things uh, until I figured out that this, the, the reason we have a meteorologist is because of Project Loon. So this person is an expert in high-level cloud and high-level wind motion, I mean. So he helps, he built the model to help maintain those balloons over particular areas to provide internet coverage after disasters. But he was very generous to go through and tag all of our images for us. So in this case, oops, you need to first define the tags that you want to use. So in this case, we have alto cumulus, zero, strat zero cumulus, zero stratus, zero, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go through and tag the images. And if you don't have the ability to do that yourself, you can actually use a human labeling service that we provide to be able to get that data, to, to get that data tagged. So we were able to get the data tagged. And as, as I said, you can see here all the different images. And you can look a little further and say, what do cumulonimbus looks like? And see all the different images. So once you have that data, then you're going to train the model. The way AutoML works today, there are two different models, two different model styles you can use. What we call um, the base model is, a, is free. It's a very quick. It builds a, a relatively small network to distinguish the images. Or you can do a more advanced model that takes several hours. You have additional data requirements for that. In the base model, you need as few as 10 images per tag in order to get some level of prediction. More data yields higher confidence in those predictions. So in this case, the model we built was actually is, is the advanced model. And we can now go in and learn something about this. So there are precision and recall curves that is done. So we automatically, in training the model, we withhold about 20% of the data. 
for doing testing. And in this case, we see that the you know, false positive rate and false negative rate is fairly good. We're, we can expect to get reasonable predictions in this case. So 84% precision and 70% recall. Um, and it also gives us the confusion matrix. So we can see where we're likely to have problems and where we may want to collect more data in order to increase the confidence in our predictions. So let's go ahead and do some predictions. I can do that from here in the, in the, um, in the web-based AI, but I'm gonna go ahead. We built a small application uh, in Firebase that runs on the web or runs on your phone, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it in that. So I'm gonna upload a cloud photo. And this may take a few seconds to fire up. Okay, good, it did it right away. So it says this is a cumulus cloud with 96% confidence. And you can, in, in your case, you're trying to predict the weather. It says this is probably okay for your event. Um, these are typical on warm, sunny days and life is good. But if I get from another location, I get another image and it runs the prediction on this. And this one is a cumulonimbus that it says it has lower confidence in this case. We went to the confusion matrix, we could see why. In this case, it says, uh-oh, this is likely to cause thunderstorms. So you may want to you know, go order that tent quickly. So that is the demo. So let me go back to the slides and tell you kind of what's going on behind the scenes here. So the intent of this type of system is to be able to allow researchers, companies, people to add their own specific domain information on top of the pre-trained models. So examples in manufacturing, examples in retail, to be able to identify styles of clothing, for instance, to make predictions of what someone else may want to purchase next. Um, Disney is using this to help customers be able to um, find find additional video resources and additional uh, products related to a particular character that they like. So if, they're, if their daughter is into Ariel, um, they can quickly recommend uh, things that the person can do to help spend more money with Disney. So um, this is an entirely database system. You, have to, you need to know absolutely nothing about machine learning, neural networks, anything else in order to use this. You upload the tag data, it runs, a, it runs a series of model creations and trains and tests that data to see which network architecture is gonna yield the best results and then makes that available for you to do predictions. So there are really three key concepts going on here for AutoML. The first is it has to find the correct neural network architecture. And traditionally, neural networks, including all the big ones at Google, have been you know, painstakingly hand-built and refined over years. Um, there are not a lot of uh, people with the skills to build those type of networks and do the, the ongoing training and refinement. Uh, this is a very challenging thing to do. Um, you also then it uses transfer learning. So we're using, let's say, of a, of a 50 layer network for doing uh, vision identification, perhaps at layer 40, it jumps in and now has identified multiple classes of objects. You can then insert your portion of this, of this, of this trained model based on your domain specific information to allow it to identify those objects along with the broader information. And then it has to automatically find the correct um, the correct hyperparameters in order to tune that to yield the best results. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, um, you can go to the Vizier paper. There are links online. Uh, anybody afterwards wants to uh, come see me, I'm happy to give specific links. So this is all our very basic stuff for the next couple of slides, just kind of reinforcing how these things work. Um, neural networks to distinguish between a cat and a dog. Someone would build multiple layers. The, the, uh, the neurons would be, the neurons that were successful would be reinforced through the hyperparameter tuning, and at the end of that, you get an output of a cat or a dog. 
These neural networks are built up. Each layer does some number of different things. So the very, the very first levels may just distinguish edges and colors. Then it's going to identify features and then groups of features until it finally can distinguish a Labrador Retriever from a Tiger Cat. So this is what the Google Net model for vision looked like uh, in 2015, I believe. Um, this is the beginning of inception, and it was a, a state-of-the-art vision recognition algorithm at the time, 39 layers deep. Um, in order to tune, not just design that network, but in order to design the neural network and then tune those parameters, obviously is lots and lots of work. There's a tool, uh, this is a good visualization tool um, for understanding that process. And I'm a very visual person, so I like using this. So I'm gonna go drop into a demo on this. Uh, this is, you can try this yourself at playground.tensorflow.org. So this is kind of a cool tool. So can you see that a little bit? So this has different data sets that you can try to train a model on. This multicolor spiral is kind of interesting. I think it's, it's, the, it's the most difficult one they have in this, in this example. You see there are red and, red and orange dots. The orange dots are negative one and the blue dots are one. And we're trying to distinguish between those. So I can start out with this example model. I'm gonna use a rectified linear unit activation layer and I'm gonna try this using the default suggested network. And it's gonna run through multiple, you'll, you see the steps counting up in the upper left. And as it learns, it's trying to show you what's going on here with the, uh, with the colors here. So the, the blue is it's starting to refine this. It's, the blue is the prediction area that it's trying to match to the data. And you see this is not doing very, very well. You know, it, it's, it's, it's doing quite poorly, as a matter of fact. So this example is not a good thing. So let's go ahead and try a hyperbolic function on this using the same network and let's see how it does. So I'm showing this because there are lots of ways to design a neural network to achieve the goals that you want. Some are gonna be effective, some are gonna be efficient. Finding the optimal spot for that is challenging. So this also doesn't look like it's doing too good. So let's go ahead and stop that. And because this is the data here we're trying to fit is circular. So let's go ahead and add sign function onto this and see how we do. And now I'm adding additional features at the first layer and oh, this is starting to look a little bit better. So now is, I don't know if you can see the, the numbers, probably not. Yeah, so let me blow this up a little bit, see if it, it can still fit this here. There we go. So you see that the underneath output up here, that's test loss and training loss. So it's right now it's about 5% test loss, and, it, and it's done a little over a thousand different iterations trying to tune this. And it hasn't done too bad, but there's, it still doesn't really look like the data we're trying to fit. So let's add a couple more neurons here in the second layer and try it again. And you see now it's starting to get to results much faster. This network is now better, better, um, better designed to identify the traits in this particular data set. So now we're gonna do one and a half percent test loss and under a percent in the training loss in this. But it still looks a little bit pained there. So let's try adding a layer and see, see what that does. So here's going to be, notice there was some, some jitter there. It had a little trouble passing through some domain set. There it is, it's jittering again. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit stuck there, okay? But we're, we're like 3% loss, so we've made a more complex network that isn't as good 
as what we had before. And this again is a real world case that you see when you're, when you're defining these types of neural networks by hand. So let's go back down to where we were. I'm gonna add one more neuron here, see how we do. And let's see, so I'm gonna go run that to, out to 1,000 again. And here now, I see the spiral structure that I'm expecting to see. It's a good fit for this set of two-dimensional data. So I'm at 300 now. I'm already down to 1% test loss and under a percent on the training loss. So this now looks like a pretty good network for distinguishing the features I want within this data set. I'm going to run out to 1,000 and see where we end up here. And it looks pretty stable, so it, it, it's gotten to as good as it's going to get. So we're at, you know, at half a percent on the training loss and 1% and on the test loss. So again, I wanted to show that to, sh to kind of demonstrate visually that more complex networks aren't necessarily better. You want to find the sweet spot. And that sweet spot can be depending on what you want to look for. Do you want incredibly high precision? Do you want efficiency? There's some combination of those, of those values that produce the function that you want. So let's go back here. So this evolutionary approach to identifying machine learning models is what AutoML does. Um, this is showing an extreme example that of, it starts out with a, a, a very small and effectively random neural network. And then it, ex, it tries other examples of architectures, additional layers, additional nodes at a given layer, and it keeps trying it. The ones that produce good results, it continues to refine those. And it ignores the ones, it drops the ones that weren't producing good results. So in this particular graph, the gray nodes have all been rejected. And the blue nodes are still actively being tried. So this is some number of thousands of iterations that's gone through to, to pick out a particular model. And you can see what that model looks like um, at various points along the way. And this is all um, in published paper as well, so you're welcome to, to go explore these all in, in greater detail. What's interesting is this methodology of evolutionary neural networks is already achieving better results than many of those hand-tuned, hand-refined models that have been built by researchers over time. So very quickly, we saw that even a relatively small model in AutoML was beating inception of a couple of years ago. And as we train it further, it is producing better results than the best hand-trained models today. And what's also interesting is that it's producing neural networks that humans really haven't conceived. You know, humans have biases and we have, you know, we have tools we learn to apply. The machine learning doesn't really care. It's gonna try things randomly and see what works and then go off and explore that further. So the model on the left was, an art, was a recurrent, network, recurrent neural network designed by humans and the one on the right was designed by AutoML. And it had higher performance than the, than the hand-trained model. So you also then get into the tuning. We did a, we, oh, you saw the tuning of the hyperparameters as in, uh, in the playground TensorFlow as it was the colors were morphing. That's the hyperparameters being tuned to show the results with that particular network. The, the space to do that, the amount of computation necessary to do that, if you're applying it on random networks, you're going to see that basically you're going to use all compute cycles for the rest of humanity if you don't do that in some type of intelligent way. So even in a simple case of four parameters with you know, three, 10, and five, you have a 12-hour training time to do, a, to do training data and test for each one of those examples. You end up with basically an entire uh, year of compute to, to, to fully map out all of the potential, um, all potential space. And you know, our, our human brains are good at looking at two and three dimensional objects. When you go deeper than that, we lose the ability to visualize. So this is a nice example using, using three dimensional data 
What we want to avoid is finding these local maximums that look like the potentially best solution. We have to explore lots of space and see where we're going to reach the highest possible maximum. So in this case, we don't want to find all these waves on the left. We want to find the best result up high. And so what AutoML is doing is it is running about 20,000 different network architectures in that advanced model. And it figures out for your particular data set which ones are yielding better results. And in this example, I say that we had one here with a moderate learning rate and a moderate number of layers that had a data fit of 97%. By, by slowing or speeding the learning rate or by adding additional layers, it, it doesn't get any better than that. So AutoML is designed to be able to identify those domain maximums and be able to get there quickly and then be able to train that model to do, hopefully, even better than you could do by writing the model yourself without all that years of expertise necessary to do it on your own. So I have, I have lots more stuff here um, on some of the other, um, some of the other pre-trained models, but this talk was intended to be primarily about AutoML and we only have five minutes left for questions. So I think I will leave it there. Um, this is the links to the, uh, the pages where you can go try out these yourself. You can upload images, you can upload videos, you can type in text to translate, you can type in, you can send an audio file and get the text back. Um, they're all very handy things. And um, today AutoML is only available within the vision domain um, and there have been no, um, no announcements about anything more than that. But I think it's reasonable to assume that Google uh, would be interested in, in making AutoML available within other domains along, the, along these lines. So with that, I will take any questions that you might have. <laughs> We need the AutoML question generator. <laughs> so I will be. I'm going to be around the rest of the day. So if you have any other questions, or uh, you know, if you like to get uh, links to some of this, I'd be happy to uh, happy to provide that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, very, very quick announcements before we break for lunch. Um, just being informed from the, the college that there is quite a strong